Oh boy, here we go. Enterprise hits and misses video Friday and returning champion Brian Summer. What's going on? Yeah, I'm glad to be here defending my title belt. Uh, you know, as the intercontinental ERP grand champion wrestler of all time, uh, you know, I just want to say it's takedown time. We're ready to kick some butt. And I can't wait to be there next Saturday at the San Jose Coliseum to take on the king of ERP himself, Mac Daddy 2.0. Okay, let's get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> mo mo most excellent. I, I look forward to uh, the whiteboard session already. Uh, well, first, of there's a preliminary demo a thon that will go on for four hours and there will be no winner. Oops, I shouldn't have disclosed that. Uh, but anyway, uh, th you know, we've got a whole slate full of great acts there at the big uh, uh, ERP WrestleMania kind of thing. Go ahead. So anyhow, yesterday we didn't have a show at all. Um, now we have a real show. Um, so, so just to give you guys a little bit of context, we're going to be talking about uh, cloud ERP meltdowns, problems, um, and benefits. Um, and, and Greg, um, you've brought this up before about, um, Periscope. I don't even know if you can hear this right now, but we're going to still live stream on Twitter after Periscope's gone. So don't worry your pretty little head about that anymore. Um, anyhow, <laughs> uh, back, back to the scheduled state of affairs. So, so we're going to be looking at cloud ERP benefits and meltdowns and, 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 and Brian, um, bless his PowerPoint savvy heart in 24 hours has whipped up a slideshow that is literally going to deconstruct ERP as you know it. Um, and we're going to show you that in just a couple of minutes. But uh, I just wanted to explain briefly part of the goal of this is that a couple of years ago I delineated a piece on achieving advanced benefits out of cloud ERP. And a good chunk of that was provoked by my frustration with customers who uh, simply have not taken enough um, initiative, in my opinion, to move beyond the sort of go live benefits into deeper benefits. And now we're pretty far along into the pandemic. Everyone's working remotely effectively, but where are the real benefits? And I, my argument is you really have to push for them in order to achieve them. Um, so I sent Brian a bunch of my copy and Brian has his own ERP project horror shows, but he also has some really useful deconstructions of all of this content. And so one of the goals here is to eventually move into kind of a future of ERP show in the future here. Um, but before we can do that, we really have to take an unflinching look at the present, which includes still a whole hell of a lot of cloud washing, lift and shift BS, and over promises that aren't delivered. Brian, you know all about that, man. Been there, seen it, lived it, got the scar tissue. Go ahead. Yeah, it's real. Yeah, so, um, so we, will, we will welcome your comments uh, throughout the show. Um, but in, in the meantime, uh, Brian, shall I load up your, your deck? Do you want to walk us through some of that? Yeah, let's get on. With All right. It. Let's, cool. let's start All right. delighting the audience here. All right. Let's 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 pop into the deck here. Um, I don't have presentation mode for y'all, but I have um, something you should be able to see pretty well. So uh, we'll just do that now. Application window, cloud ERP, share. All right. This should be visible to you. Cloud ERP values benefits meltdowns and i do like that cloudy la landscape brian that that does that, yeah, that, that has a dis distinct multi-tenant look to it i would say i took that picture out of the side of a jet aircraft on one of the last flights i took so you know that's over a year ago so uh anyway let's keep right. going <laughs> yeah all right so on to the next all right what, what do we got walk us through it so what um what all these slides I've got the same format on the left we're talking about things that you as a, a buyer of enterprise software what you wanted is on the left and what you probably did or what you got is going to be on the right and these are no particular order I don't know there's eight or nine of these things and uh, I thought John and I'd just kind of use this as a jumping off point for where we'll have some probably free flowing pointed discussion. I can already tell John's probably going to turn this into a Mondo Diginomica piece, but uh, anyway. Oh, yeah. Um, so let's get get on with it. one of the first things a lot of people want is they want a single source of the truth. Oh, and yeah. And they want, you know, they want a any given data value, like what is a customer, what is a vendor, what is a, uh, what is the accounting period, what does this account in the chart of accounts, you know, mean? They want that same consistent meaning. 
the same format for it and everything else. What they want to do, and I think it's it's quite right, is they want to get away from all these like translation tables where you take, oh, uh, if the account number was X, Y, Z in this divisional p l well, now we want to make that one, two, three, four at the headquarters one, which makes being able to do anything like drill down and drill around nigh on to impossible. It, it adds errors, latency, and a million one other things. So I get it why people want to do that. And I get why they want the single source of truth. They want to be able to just boom, put, press a button, and anything and everything you need to know about a customer, vendor, an employee, whatever, is right then and there. It's a great idea. But that's not what they get. And what they often end up doing is they I don't know. They, I, I see clients that sort of run out of steam. They buy a new piece of like ERP software and they put it in in one location and they never bother to go extricate all the other old products and or either old configurations of the new product that are running at every different plant and division. So they end up with this Tower of Babel problem that, you know, it's still there. Nobody knows what the hell's going on in the company. Data meanings are all over the map. And like I was at a client the other day where, uh, believe it or not, they couldn't, they were stunned to find out that the cost of a ton of finished product varies from $45 a ton at one plant to 123 at another. And it's the same product. And, and it took them a, a fortune to figure that out. And they, and they had that problem because none of their systems are the same. Um, anyway, you get this problem because of bad integrations. They've got way too many best of breed things. They got way too many old products out there. I think the ERP vendor uh, are off, often at fault because they buy a lot of you know, like cloud products to make their portfolio sound cloudy, and then they never bother to integrate them. So they've got different data elements and all that. And I know some of you people listening on the call go, oh, but Brian, we use a state-of-the-art, you know, integration tool and it will do all the data mapping. Yeah, uh, but it, all it takes is somebody to add a new account somewhere, enter in a new customer, or whatever, and things start popping loose like a popcorn popper. And you're right back to where they were all along. They don't have a master data management process and it's screwed up. John. But, but Brian, what if you have a, what if you have a nice sexy dashboard? Isn't it's not good enough, man? I mean, as long as it looks good. <laughs> you know, you know, if a vendor said that to me, I'd probably come across the table and come after him. But uh, no, that's not going to solve the problem, John. And you know that. I know you're being a, uh, just being provocative. Yeah, but, yeah. But this is a big problem. Uh, you know, how can you really run a modern? Uh, digital, real-time kind of business and still not know what's going on in your company. That's the first problem. Looks like uh, looks like Den Hallett can't get enough of ERP on the on his retirement weekend. How you doing, wow. Den? I hope you had a nice birthday as well. Uh, this is not an ERP problem. It's an MDM problem. Well, I did. It's uh, and it's a problem with a project team that doesn't understand the big picture. And we'll talk probably some more about that in a subsequent point. But if you don't really know where you're going, know why you want to do this, and you don't have the discipline to deal with the master data, you know, issue. And Den's right on the money on that. Then you're going to screw up. You're going to miss some golden opportunity to fix things in a major way in your firm. Uh oh. To uh, Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, yeah, D Dan. No, no apology, dude. You're right on the money, Dan. Absolutely, grab the popcorn and rain on the parade, man. You're here. Glad to have you. Uh, Greg, Greg is responding to your <laughs> dash. <laughs> I can't eat dashboards. <laughs> yeah, come on, Greg, man. As long as the executives can show show their pals on the golf course that they can check their company's heartbeat in a moment on their dashboard it doesn't matter if the information underneath is dirty and incomplete and poorly integrated uh, anyhow uh <laughs> den also says it's a problem for shadow it oh yeah yeah and you're i didn't put that in here and that's a good catch den um the um it always astonishes me not only how much shadow it is out there but how much shadow technical debt exists because a lot of that shadow it comes with uh the responsibility somebody needs to maintain this stuff and patch the firmware and everything else and it just didn't there brian we're on to slide number two 
Well, what you wanted, I hear this all the time, executives, I don't know, they go to the World Economic Forum in Davos and they come back, we need to be a, a, a digitally transformed company and we need to have reinvented all our processes and reimagine uh, everything from our business model down to our technology stuff. I mean, it's, it's all super fantastic, you know, what they want to do. And I get it. The only problem is um, what happens, and we might get a we might really get into some great conversation on this point is vendors love to sell how simple and quick you can implement one of their products, their packages. And they have these super fast methodologies. And whenever I hear that, I start cautioning my clients, like don't fall for that because it's a siren song. Your, your whole benefit value prop is going to go crashing up against the rocks. And you're, you know, and here's the problem. When you look at these fast methodologies, 90% of them have a couple of commonalities. One is you take the data out of the old system and you map it into the new system. At no point in that process is someone radically rethinking anything. They're just lifting and shifting to a slightly newer technology platform. And that's really about it. Um, Shadow Tech Debt is, yeah, okay, thanks, Meg. I haven't seen yeah. Meg in a while, so it's good to see. Good to see you. Yep, Meg Bear chiming in on shadow check shadow tech debt is exactly the issue. Meg, feel free to elaborate on that, but it sounds right in line with what we're talking about. Uh, Den also says one word blueprints, and then he makes a snarky run simple <laughs> joke. Ouch. Um, yeah, well, I always tell clients run away uh, more than anything else. Uh, you know, bad vendors, bad products. Right, whatever. Brian. I do. I do want to make one comment on your on your. What did you get? You got um, incrementalism. I remember. Oh, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna, I'll tell you guys a brief Brian summer anecdote. Um, we were in a a gr grc related briefing with a large ERP vendor. Uh, I'll leave it to you guys to guess. You can guess from the previous context, perhaps. But anyhow. Um, one thing that happens to Brian sometimes in a briefing when he doesn't like what he's hearing, sometimes he's kind of quiet at first, which might surprise you, but it's kind of like, I call it the tea kettle effect. And I can see that the water's starting to boil up as Brian get more and more frustrated. And towards the end, you blew a cap and, and you said, <laughs> all I'm seeing right now is a study in incrementalism. <laughs> and these guys thought they were showing off their great new platform. And um, anyway, so yeah. incrementalism, incrementalism is the enemy of a uh, of real, real change. Right. So. Right. And uh, I would uh, I, I don't know. I, I should be embarrassed by that anecdote. But I will tell you, John, you're you're not the only person who can, who's constantly reminds me of that. Um, all right. Well, anyway, let's get back to this problem. You, um, Dan, just real quick, just real quick. Some of the fast implementations were BS sold by snake oil, snake people. So that's then chiming in on the problem with fast. And that, that was something that my, um, my uh, now uh, RIP departed friend, Michael Doan always emphasized in his writings, uh, which was that the, the rush to go live in, in ERP is often a, a classic mistake of overlooking crucial changes in process and governance and so on. Yeah. And uh, so, look, look, you know, I mean, you guys can read all the points on the right. Um, and I think many of you know some of these, but let, let me tell you why this is, where this really goes off the rails. Uh, and uh, this is one that's real close to me right now with a, one of my clients. They've got a, uh, they just bought new ERP. They already picked an implementer to put it in who's doing the rapid implementation. And they've transferred some of the responsibility for some of the systems configuration and so forth over to the implementer who's trying to bring it in on a, the lowest possible cost, not necessarily with any eye towards doing anything radical, new, or different. Uh, I and my team, we get in there and we realize this is a company that doesn't know what it costs for them to make their products. And yet they're putting in manufacturing and finance and all the other kind of stuff. So one of the big things we kept pushing was, okay, we know you have a team working to implement cost accounting right now. Have they thought about these all these other things? And it turns out huge amounts of this stuff had never even been pondered by the implementation teams because they're so focused on getting something in quick as opposed to 
thinking, what's the big picture? What are we trying to do as a company? And what this company really wants to do is to figure out a way to understand, are we making money by uh, with each individual customer, by order, by product, by product line, by plant? And they have none of that. They have absolutely none of it. So unless you have someone who's going to architect and Dan used the word engine, design engineers or something like that in his comment a moment ago. You need someone to really architect this stuff and then communicate, communicate, communicate exactly what you're trying to deliver as a company and a finished solution when it's over with. If there's no one there who's responsible for reimagining and reinventing stuff, I guarantee you won't, you know, it, you're just going to suffer a terrible death. And worse is the problem when you get a vendor who says, oh, first you need to upgrade to our new on-prem product, and then you're going to upgrade to another level, which will get you more better position for digital future, and it'll be a platform. I hate these platform sales messages. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then, and there's like, you die of a thousand cuts because I'm telling you right now, folks, uh, one of big petrochemical CIO once time told me he spent six hundred million dollars implementing his ERP suite. Now, think about that number. He goes, "Oh, we got a lot of value out of it." And he goes, "But we—I'll never go to the board and ask for that kind of money ever again." So the idea of re implementing it a second time or whatever just isn't within the capital, you know, capabilities of even this guy. And people screw up left and right on this. This is why a lot of it doesn't happen. Sorry, John, I talked all over you. I know you got some great horror stories here, too. Uh, yeah, well, actually, I was just queuing up a little quote from a recent piece. Uh, actually, it was on Unit 4, but I said uh, many cloud ERP companies speak in terms of next-gen architectures these days, intelligent platforms, multi-tenancy, workflow automation, low code and such. Alas, some still use glossy language to cloud wash legacy architectures, or they talk of private cloud solutions even your grandmother wouldn't host. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. I, I'm sure there was a strike through in there somewhere that you just flew over, but yeah, yeah and, it was good. And, 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 and look, I mean, I think that's part of the problem now is that every, every ERP vendor is coming at you with the exact same pretty much billing, right? Like Mm -hmm. um, so, some of them talk hybrid cloud more than others, but in general, it's on the customer to figure out exactly what they mean by cloud and what, what the deployments actually look like, um, you know, how they receive software updates, whether they can customize the code base or not. It's up to the customer to investigate all of that. Yeah, I just... I don't know why I'm still thinking about that anecdote you were sharing about me slowly, you know, I was being quiet for too long and slowly, bold, you know, building to an explosion. Uh, just this week, I, did, I was on a briefing with uh, Workday, and I didn't say a word on the entire briefing call. And I guess that bothered the daylights out of their analyst relations people, and one was immediately on uh, – uh, sending me a text message like, is everything okay? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I mean, it was fine. I mean, nothing wrong. I mean, I, um, but anyway, let's keep going. Um, uh, I got a couple of things from Dennis. One question is uh, housekeeping. How do I s see other comments on iPhone? Um, Den, I haven't used this on the iPhone, but um, the main place people comment is on LinkedIn, though there are some other destinations people comment on. Um, which you can't see, but if you can't see the LinkedIn stream and you want me to um, give you the LinkedIn um, video, let me know and I'll pop you the LinkedIn into the chat. Um, if you're already on LinkedIn and you can't see the comments in your iPhone, I'm not really sure what the deal is there. Um, and then Den goes on to say, it would be nice if uh, some got the frocking basics right rather than spewing <laughs> buzzword bingo. Well... <laughs> Which brings us right to the next slide, I think. Just sitting to dance in some of these meetings, you know, these briefings. That's uh, it's been too long. All right. Um, well, here's another one of these areas. So, lots of vendors talk about having connectors to cool new technology and everything else, but the actual connection, connecting of it, doesn't happen as much as you might think. And part of the problem is. If you actually get off, get out of your office, your desk, your house, wherever you're working these days, and go walk 
the shop floor in a lot of places or the electric plant or the windmill farm, whatever it is. What you'll realize is a lot of these clients or companies, they don't have much of anything standard. Uh, you know, they buy equipment over decades sometimes. They might have a, a brand new, you know, like uh, just even go, uh, I was interviewing a fellow the other day and uh, he was telling about an IoT project they did at a wind uh, turbine uh, farm. And I said, well, that's got to be real standardized. He goes, oh, no, no, no. He goes, this one farm had 239 uh, generators. And it turned out uh, maybe they were from seven different manufacturers. And almost every single one of them had uh, different equipment in it. You know, one might have had a slightly bigger uh, generator. Some had a little bit different armature. Some had already been repaired with uh, different vendors, you know, uh, aftermarket parts, whatever. And it goes, and also depending on some other characteristics of what size blades they put on them, they perform differently and it wears out or tears up the, um, uh, you know, like bearings and the like at different rates and speeds. It goes, it was almost impossible to put that together. I, I point this out because I, when I go to clients, I find like an 80 year old stamping machine, it's not even analog, let alone digital. Right. And you're not gonna be able to put anything on it. And, and to a great extent, and if you don't think about the cost, and this is the hang up here, people don't put the cost of wiring up their factory of the future and all that kind of stuff in their business case to buy new ERP. If you don't account for it, it won't get funded and it won't happen. And so you're not going to get any kind of great IoT or industrial IoT. You're not going to get enterprise asset management. You're not going to get all this real time information flowing back and forth. Um, between the operational technology at the plant level and IT at the corporate level. And Dan, you're right. That, uh, and contrary to what that governor in Texas seems to want to blame all their energy problems on, wind it was not the issue. So anyway. Yeah. All right. Um, we could probably spend another 45 minutes on Texas, but I don't think we should do that. <laughs> A lot of questionable decisions being made in that state of late. Um, yeah. But, um, but, you know, and, and Brian, you hit on a point that I'll probably come back to later, but to me, part, part of when you talk about like real, pushing for real cloud ERP benefits versus sort of boilerplate um, it is, is really treating it as an industry solution, right? N not as a back office solution. And that's a huge distinction in my mind because the industry solution means that your shop floor systems are included. You know, once once you if you're just talking about the financial back office, then your finance isn't linked in like you were telling me the other day about your prob problems that one of your clients was having assessing the cost of various, uh, you know, things they're producing and they didn't have that tied in or integrated. Well, that's a low value ERP system. That's basically just an administrative system. And if that's all ERP vendors can provide, then they're going to get ring fenced into oblivion uh, and customers aren't going to achieve the value. And I think it's an important point people need to really take to heart. It doesn't matter. I know we've used some manufacturing examples, but you could be a wholesale distributor. You could be in the services business. There is an industry or vertical set of applications that are much closer to the customer that you've got to pay attention to. And if they're not part of the part of the business case and the design thinking around the ERP, uh, then uh, you're going to you're going to miss a huge chunk of the value opportunity. And you're right. That's what makes these things go TCO, not ROI. Yeah. And uh, LinkedIn user says, so we need to update the manufacturing operations with the ability to be passed on to ERP easily, which actually gets back to your cost accounting piece you wrote on Diginomica recently. Do you want to explain why that's so important? So a couple of things are going on. Uh, number one is, uh, a lot of ERP stuff was designed when we thought about the world in like accounting periods at, you know, every four weeks or a month or whatever, five by four or whatever method you use. Or we saw pay periods where you pay people every two weeks or weekly or twice a month, whatever. Those kind of, those kind of time dimensions assumed um, kind of a cost of doing technology that was really expensive or doing the process. It just took a lot of time and money to do it. Now it doesn't. And yet a lot of the systems are still based on that old paradigm. And, and I don't know if that was the word of the day 
John, but uh, so, you know. oh, paradigm. I, I don't know if we should go with the uh, <laughs> or okay. or Brian. It might be time to bring out the infamous uh, the BS. <laughs> Bullshit. All right. Anyway, well, go on. I, I like that. I like that button. It's got my initials on it. Um, anyway, uh, so we we have this issue that we're, we 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 now have the ability with sensors and new you know and hyperscalers and massive data stores and everything else that we should be able to take all kinds of data almost instantaneously and do real time. Uh, assessments about are we did we make any money this minute this hour this millisecond this day whatever on, on this order there's no reason you can't do that unless you had no imagination and you put in your new ERP system using those old time markers of the past then how it says vendors report talking the biz language across industries while cross thinking the needs of the CIO who has to manage these landscapes um, Greg, Greg says, uh, agreed, it's all continuous streaming now. And, you know, the interesting thing about that, Brian, is that one of the buzzwords that I actually kind of like is the sort of continuous trend. Um, mm -hmm. Not, I, I don't like it in the sense that I think vendors use it as kind of over-promising, like how many companies are ready for a continuous close, for example, yeah. or in, and how many companies are really ready for continuous planning. But I like it from an aspirational standpoint as far as confronting uh, CFOs and customers with the fact that we need to do these things in, in much closer to real-time components, right? And we need to be able to make decisions on the fly with up-to-date data. And we really haven't been able to do that. And we have to go back to vendors and say, why not? And one of the biggest weaknesses most ERP vendors have is that they're really not true data platforms. They might imply that they are, but that single source of truth you talked about only works with smaller companies that are really residing on one system. Once you get to more complex environments, it starts to break down. And once you bring up looking up like in incorporating weather patterns or, or perhaps uh, vaccination trends or what have you into your decision making based on external data, how many ERP vendors have a good answer to that? Not very many. No. And, and if you're looking at something that still runs on a traditional uh, RDBMS, it's sort of doubtful that it that you're going to be able to do some of those big data cuts. Oh my goodness, did we lose John? Oh, there you oh, are. Oh my gone? <laughs> no, you're <Okay>. there. <laughs> you you disappeared for a moment, and I was wondering. Uh, uh, if I, if I disappear again, just keep on prattling on, and I'll hopefully <laughs> come back. But uh, dense dense has continuous cash management, indeed. Where are we on the slide deck, Brian? So talk to us about this slide. We pretty much covered it, but are there a few things you wanted to mention on here that we didn't get to? I, you know, the bottom line is, again, if, you're, if your ERP team is only looking at, uh, like you mentioned, John, things in the back office, possibly maybe a little front office stuff in there like CRM, they're probably not looking at the whole big picture. And if you don't bring all this other kind of stuff, not just inside the four walls of your enterprise, but like you just described, uh, all the big external data stores uh, to really find out what's impacting your constituents, whether it's uh, job candidates, employment candidates, um, uh, suppliers, customers, you name it, uh, sales prospects, it, you, you need to have real time, as much real time kind of uh, data coming in to inform what it is you want to do but if you just look at it as we need to replace our transaction processing you know our data going into the general ledger well you're not thinking very big you're not you're going to spend a whole lot of money expose your company to a lot of risk and you're not going to get any real benefits to show for it and i think that's the bottom line on that slide indeed all right let's press on to number five so this one i put in here because it keeps coming up at company after company the last several years. Uh, there's this desire by a lot of execs to create the one global firm. You know, uh, you know, we want to do things. We want to create the Diginomica way to use, your, you know, yours and Dan's right. company. Okay. And what it usually translates to is we want to have one way that we make products we want to do it consistently everywhere we make them. Uh, some of my clients, they want to use the identical machine tooling and design technologies 
are consistent around the world. They want the same communication capabilities. Everything is the same. I had one that even they were making uh, commercial engines and they wanted to make every plant have the same, uh, not just layout of the shop floor, but have the physical building, parking lot, everything the same everywhere around the planet. Um, and, you know, I told them that ain't gonna work, but, uh, but still, Every, you know, I see this goal coming out all the time. And the reason they want to do that is not only can they make their, um, there's a couple of hidden things here. One is they can move then any person, any manager, executive, thought leader, whatever, around anywhere to the planet, and they can be instantly productive because everything is consistent. But there's another reason, and that is they want to be able to be able to know exactly what it's costing to make things, whatever, and shift production anywhere in the world. And they want to have uh, massive uh, flexibility in moving production if some kind of uh, weird thing happens. And we've seen some stuff in recent years. There was a huge fire in Southeast Asia that took the semiconductor industry out because it was all too concentrated in one market. We've seen uh, the tsunami and uh, results uh, when that earthquake um, hit in uh, Japan. And they had the um, uh, they had the problem with the nuclear uh, issue there as well, and we can go on and on. And you know, it can rat and just like the pandemic screwed up supply chains. A lot of companies would like to be able to readjust. What they also want is if everything's the same, then they can create not only digital twins about how they want to run their firm, but they could actually physically run all their business on the shoreline of a company if they've got it all wired up and done consistently. But you can't get there if you let every plant division, plant manager, whatever, screw it up and do their own thing. So that's a problem. I saw Dennett weighed in with a comment. I didn't get a chance to read it, but yep. anyway. We'll put it back on for a sec. <clears throat> he said what, what you said was spot on, but that was a few minutes ago, so I'm not sure which of your comments, but he says IT needs to think about the percentage split between support, my sin, delivering value. Uh, and then he goes on to say companies who think the way Brian sees are doomed to failure. These companies are seeing the world through a single dimension where there are at least four to five major factors that impact the way supply chains operate. Yep. I, I don't disagree. And in fact, there's a lot of work going on supply chain right now. Um, um, a colleague that's working with me on one project, we're going to flip roles on the next project for that client because they need to really rethink and reimagine and reconfigure their supply chain based on new knowledge they're going to have about um, where their most efficient uh, facilities are, where their customers are located, what's the right mix of things um, to, um, uh, you know, to use, whether it's an internal warehouse uh, or a 3PL or whatever. So, yeah, the supply chain and where you put your facilities and everything else is, has to be re-looked at uh, right now. LinkedIn user says we have identified that spot on. We are adjusting accordingly. Um, Brian, I wanted to ask you a question about where we've arrived at so far. We haven't covered all your slides yet, but we are going to get there uh, because we're doing a little uh, narrated death by PowerPoint today, folks. Uh, but hopefully the video interaction makes makes it fun. Sorry you have to stare at the slides. Sorry that's, about that. That's because the uh, screen share toggle, I'm still working it out, and it's easier for me to just keep the screen share on for now until I get a little more uh, well-versed in this. But anyhow, um, so, so Brian, wh when you kind of look at how we're falling short here, uh, all of your slides are kind of what you wanted versus what you got. Um, where, where do you kind of assign the blame pie here? So in other words, uh, here's, here's some potential areas where companies are, are fouling up. It could be selecting the wrong ERP software. It could be the inherent limitations of what ERP is capable of today. It could be that their services partner is not the right one for th their industry and expertise. Um, it could be that they simply don't have the right broad organizational buy-in that you described that you need to go beyond one location into a deeper level of buy-in. And, and likely in many cases, it's a combination of those factors and more. But how would you, if you had to apportion a blame pie for these underperforming projects, where, where would you put it? I think the problem starts 
there's generally not as big a problem with somebody maybe picking a bad technology, although I often run into companies where I'm scratching my head going like, I don't think I would have recommended that, but nonetheless, that's not the biggest issue. There's a disconnect that happens almost immediately after a solution's bought. That is, they don't know, they don't know what their real vision is and have articulated. They made a technical decision about what to buy from a, you know, workhorse ERP, for example, but they don't have the grand plan put together of all the different inner uh, interdependent kind of um, other projects that have to take place if they're going to get the most value out of the ERP. Uh, so there's is that that I think is an internal management problem. Um, the uh, I don't blame the individual project teams that clients have for not knowing what that vision is. It's not necessarily maybe either within their pay grade or whatever skill set to know that that again is top leadership should have had that vision and relentlessly communicated and make sure that every team knows the totality of what they're supposed to do and how it interconnects with the other projects and knows where they fit in in this big puzzle it's not one thing you're going to implement you're implementing something that is to benefit many other systems and processes and, and the other issue is management never freed up a lot of people to actually go out, kick tires, and see what is the art of the possible. How do you know how to reinvent something if you have no idea what else is available out there in the market, what you could do with it? Now, that's on the client side, the buyer side, excuse me. On the seller side, I'm, I'm really having problems with these oversimplified messages of how easy you can put something in when there's no recognition really of how that super fast implementation actually facilitates uh, simultaneous reinvention. The assumption that a lot of vendors have is let's just get the product installed and get them paying, you know, get those bookings going to our uh, you know, financial statements, and the client will have to worry about reinventing and, re you know, transformational stuff down the road. I think that's the biggest mistake going from the supplier, the seller side there. Den says uh, examples, finance availability, logistics, raw material availability, production methods, a good example is how the Soviets outplayed Germany during World War II despite producing simple vehicles, et cetera, and having inferior resources. Sorry, guys, I'm a bit of a history production nerd, says Den. Mm. Well, yeah, they... Um, shall, shall we deconstruct World War II, Brian? Uh, well, I know Den just got a new uh, Sherman tank model. I saw the picture of that the other day, and that's another one of those. Uh, the U.S. It's made some ridiculous number, like 5,500 or 55,000 of those tanks, and they were not superior to what the uh, German army had at the time. But it was sheer numbers and the capacity to crank them out at volume that made the difference. Anyway... We got one question. Uh, do you share these slides anywhere? Has anyone tried Miro? Um, Miro's not a fit with this broadcast. I can't really haven't tried it. Um, for the slides, it's up to Brian. He just whipped these up. This is kind of a last minute thing. Um, but in general, the slides that we show, uh, you can catch on the um, YouTube replays. If Brian decides to post them elsewhere, he'll I'm sure he'll do that and tweet it out if he decides to do that. Um, so. You're also, I don't know who, who that reader is, but you're also welcome. If you really want those slides, just uh, just ping me on um, Twitter. There's my uh, handle right underneath my face, and um, I could send them to you. That's not a problem. Uh, he also asked if you could create a framework to understand how we should be working. Well, Brian, you did write a book about this, so uh, that's one place to start. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, every uh, every few months, I actually pick that book up and go, uh, do I need to update it? You know, it seems like uh, every client, every project, every day, I keep learning new things. And uh, I'd like to say they're new tricks, but sometimes it's new new cautions, I guess, that clients need to watch out for. Um, but no, I, I, I've i thought about an update to the book, but uh, I actually went and looked at it. It's ironic you asked that question about two weeks ago. And I was wondering, did I really write something about this one issue? And sure enough, it was in there. It was like 180 pages back, but I had it. I actually had it in the book. Anyway. 
Uh-oh, Brian, we might have a typo on your benefits realization slide number six, you can tell me. Uh, yeah, that one, I must have been in... What you wanted was to get rid of latency, but what did you get? Why don't you just go ahead and tell us? And we well, will... you wanted to get rid of latency, and what did you get? You got pretty much uh, all the same problems you used to have. You still got... You still got spreadsheets, translation tables, you've got paper, you got whiteboards still. Uh, what you got is a lot of workers who um, liked the career security and knowing uh, that uh, my job is to manage these uh, 100 spreadsheets and I update them every single month. But then I also have to build reconciliation schedules and, 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 and uh, you know, you, you know I, I know clients want to get the latency out, the problem is um, they either don't have the stomach or the skills to stand up to some folks who want to uh, basically reinvent the spreadsheets they used to have all along and the other pockets of, they didn't finish out the integration. So, uh, here's uh, someone's asking for a link to your book. Uh, I, I'm not doing that right now because I'm screen sharing, so I don't want to I don't want you to watch me Google search, but uh, but I'm sure if you do a search of Brian Summer on Amazon, it'll come right up. Yeah, um, the, book's called, the book is called Digital with Impact. You can find it on Amazon. It's exactly right. Yep. All right. So, Brian, here we go. All right. Uh, eliminate uh, islands of automation. At mm -hmm. least that's what you thought you were going to do. Yeah. You're going to eliminate paper, spreadsheets, and whiteboards. Yeah, good yep. luck eliminating spreadsheets, by the way. Have fun with that. Yeah, well... And, no. and what did you get, Brian? Uh, what I usually see people is uh, they don't have enough budget to go and like rework and redo all the interfaces and integrations. You could put in a great real-time ERP, for example, but uh, like one of my clients uh, is dependent on getting data out of a rail system that tracks the movement of rail cars and buildings and the like from the Class 1 railroads. Problem is uh, that industry consortium system only gets updated once a month. So like we say in Texas, wanting and getting are two different things. You could want a, a real-time world, but yet you won't get it. And they don't have an, uh, I may be wrong. It may be another system to think about that. You could want an interface, but you're not going to get it. Um, so yeah, there's still all that stuff going on. But, I still see, Brian, I still see. Mm -hmm. Brian, low code's going to fix that. Low code, yeah. Low code and uh, citizen programmers, they're going to get right on it. Yeah. <laughs> was that another? Oh my God. Was that another word of the day? Citizen we're programmer. Gonna, <laughs> okay. Dude, we're okay. going to have to, we're going to have to put marketers on a uh, ERP marketers on some kind of a suicide watch this weekend, or at least we're going to have to offer up a helpline. Maybe, yeah, uh, maybe, and I know maybe you're. Of, I know some of them are listening in because I saw Stephanie Morango or at Sage uh, was predicting this could be an interesting um, bro broadcast today. But anyway, keep going. Yeah. So let's see what we, we still have a couple more, a couple more slides here. So might as well press on. Ooh, here we go. We're getting into the advanced technologies. Now we can really play some buzzword bingo. Oh, yeah. Um, chatbots, chatbots, RPA, algorithms. Basically, intelligent ERP, right? Because today's systems weren't smart, but the new systems, they're very smart. Very, very smart, Brian. Yeah, you know, every time I hear algorithm, I always think of that song, uh, My Sharona by The Knack, I think. You know, I just want to go uh, algorithm. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, that's what everyone wants. They want all this kind of stuff. Um, they're not going to get it in a lot of cases because for a lot of them, there's a whole bunch of knowledge in their company that's never been captured. It's never been codified. Uh, a lot of companies make things that um, there are people that are uh, masterful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we got some citizen developers on the okay. project there. Uh, we right. might need a might need a helpline for for those folks also. Um, uh, you, know, you know, I'm oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right, we got, boy, we're getting all um, the chatbots RPA <laughs> bullshit. Says Dan. Uh oh, here we go. I guess we got to. I, I should have. We should have started. Absolute bullshit. <laughs> 
given the visceral reaction we're getting on this one slide, we should have started this with this one. I had no idea this was going to be so uh, uh, provocative. Yeah, I mean, Den, Den raises this right time versus real time thing. I've always, I've always felt that that's the proper like language. I mean, I don't really like the right time buzzword that much either. But that's always the consideration, especially when you consider that, you know, you, you know, putting all data in the enterprise in real time is generally not realistic. And so, you have to think about what kind of decisions you're making and what do you need. Sometimes you just need a, a batch report once a week. Let's face it. Sometimes that's all you need, at least right now. Mm -hmm. Well, th this is a really thorny and interesting problem area, and I'll tell you why. A lot of companies have facilities in some pretty remote locations. Why? Because it's where there's some substantial kind of natural, reco uh, natural resource, or maybe it's access to, they put their facilities next to a giant hydroelectric dam in the middle of nowhere for cheap power, whatever it is. Problem is, do you think you could hire somebody who's uh, got a master's degree in advanced mathematics that is going to want to work there and tune and adjust your algorithms? Um, and uh, finding skilled people to do these kinds of, you know, that are going to maintain, update, and enhance these kind of applications and fix the algorithms from the machine learning uh, when they go haywire because there was some uh, anomalous information or whatever that is starting to throw the, the predictive models uh, into, into disuse. Um, I, I thought it was the other I issue that's in incredible on this is clients think that, well, if I can outsource the implementation of my ERP to a systems integrator, they should be able to do all the other stuff as well. The problem is who's going to maintain these advanced technologies once the integrator's out the door? And that's a real problem because these are not like apps. These have, you know, you need to know about statistics, about variances. You need to understand what a multivariable multivariate uh you know equation and how it gets solved all, you know it, all this stuff is very different and most clients do not have the in-house skills to tune these things uh you know from here on out you're buying both an asset when you license these advanced technologies but you also pick up a liability that you got to take care of which is you're going to have to be responsible for care and feeding it uh and I don't think a lot of folks really figure that out until it's too late. Yep. Dan points out about real time varying by role in industry. For a day trader, it's nanoseconds. For an AP person, it's daily to specify time. Yep. Uh, I, I did some stuff uh, on Staples a while back, and you know they they were doing real time pricing and inventory adjustments on their websites. You know, hyper personalized stuff on websites as far as anything that pertains to e-commerce inventory, that's obviously real time, but other things are not. And I, I think sometimes you go overboard with this real time push and you're really misleading customers in terms of the investments they need to be making, but that's one of their topic. Um, linear programming, matrix algebra. Yeah, one of the interesting things that, that, that I think is gonna come out in the coming years is vendors who claim that they can bake data science into their products versus what you're describing, which is the importance of having bona fide data scientists on your own teams that, that understand what these algorithms are trying to do and can evaluate and help request adjustments to them based on various criteria. And I'm, I'm a little skeptical that you can just bake all the data science into the product. I, I, I would really want to encourage companies to try to develop their own in-house teams and not just rely on a vendor for this. But So before you, that last little bullet point, spots, if, you, if you're the kind of company that um, um, buys this stuff and then never figures out really how to get it going internally, then you've created a software package on the shelf, spots. There's your acronym for the day, okay? Uh, and those are things that you pay dearly for and you get absolutely no value out of it. I mean, zero. So you want to avoid spots. Yeah. How's your project going? Uh, it's a little spotty, Brian, to be honest. It's a little bit spotty. Sound like Den. Okay. All right. All right. Moving on. 
uh, two more slides. We're on the second to last slide. What do we got here, Brian? Well, this was, you mentioned like cost accounting, but there's a whole bunch of things uh, people need to really rethink. Uh, how are you going to do, how are you going to value your inventory? For a lot of clients, they've been running on some kind of like um, average costing for 50 years and never really thought about it in any great detail. Is that really right or not? If you're going to change your ERP and it's going to, trigger an audit, you know, an extra audit review anyway, you might as well fix all these other kinds of questions, get it knocked out the way and do it right now going forward. Uh, there's a whole bunch of new kind of financial reporting things you want to consider, uh, environmental uh, safety and other kinds of uh, reporting that you want to do. Um, and on and on, you know, a lot, a lot of folks want all that. And they also want to be able to improve their gross margins. And that's why they want to revisit these things, just to get better precision and better understanding of what's really going on in their firm. And maybe even to report that externally, like uh, in the annual report. Unfortunately, what a lot of them get is when you convert the old data into the new system, you're going to get the same stuff and probably the same metrics, same reports. And you haven't done any of that kind of thinking. And um, you're going to end up with the unimaginative stuff. Yeah, OK, climate accounting, yep. Um, uh, it's funny when you look at, not funny, it's kind of sad actually, how many clients spend months trying to pull together the data around what they're doing on uh, climate, environmental, and safety and quality issues so they can put it in the annual report. How can something that takes you months to pull together actually be anywhere close to real time, if you will, or automated? It's all in spreadsheets uh, or and they're going around finding bits and pieces of this all over the enterprise. Uh, anyway, what you end up with, is uh, a system that it's, you know, how you got to this point is because you didn't, and I'll address Den's comment here, um, you didn't have some very imaginative people who really thought this through, or you couldn't get the folks, uh, let's say that are, who handle cost accounting, you couldn't get them to think more expansively about how can we in cost accounting, if we had the right kind of data, help the firm get the bigger margins and the better profitability and everything else. Instead of look at cost accounting as strictly an accounting function, as uh, we need to get it to start thinking about how it could do a better job of helping drive and create value for the company. And same for all these other areas uh, that are mentioned here as well. So is this a CIO issue? Uh, yes, and it is, uh, and it's not just their issue to own. This is why when you're putting in a system with a name, the first word is enterprise, it does require input from other executives across the enterprise and it needs their, their absolute support and backing to get this kind of stuff done. First, though, somebody, and it usually is the CIO, is going to have to come together, come up with the plan, the vision, the direction we're going to go, and they got to get the executive team to buy into that and help support and push that thing through. And that leads you to think about one more thing, which is do you, whether it's a CIO or not, it does this individual have the political capital to make this kind of big transformational change happen. Because without that, the thing is going to be dead on arrival uh, in no time at all. And yeah, cost accounting is kind of theoretical. I, you know, it's funny. I'm not an accountant, although I will play one on podcast, uh, but um, I'm kidding. Uh, I've got, I'm knee deep in them in my family, three in my family alone um, are CPAs. But um, anyway, never mind. So, what's our next comment here? Uh, response to your last statement uh, hmm. from Greg, maybe for the CIA, CIO who works for the CEO and not the one who works for the CFO. Yeah, or you could say or COO. Uh, you, you see variations of that, but all right, anyway, I'm you know not going to quibble on that. So, what's our what's our next? Next slide here. Uh, the grand finale, Brian. Okay. Uh oh. Oh Jack yeah. Gold debt. We're back to Meg Bear. Meg, if you're still with us, <laughs> if you made it all through these slides. Well, we wanted, uh, we wanted to eliminate technical debt, Brian. What happened? Uh, well, sometimes that gets run. That that goes haywire, also because um, they. They might have got the uh, ERP technical debt kind of cleared or most of it cleared, 
but what I'm finding is that uh, if uh, two things, if you didn't address all the other technical debt, and you know it's amazing what stops a project in the middle of the project is, oh, I need to pull resources because uh, one of our facilities has a bunch of obsolete routers, ser uh, servers, uh, switches, and the like, and no one's ever upgraded the firmware on it since the day it was installed. You, I'll ask why. Well, somebody put it. Put those devices way up in the rafters you know uh, over the whatever the warehouse uh, space they're just hard to get to and they've got a security problem or i mentioned to john on an unrelated call he and i had uh, earlier this week a problem where someone ran coax um or ethernet cable excuse me and just zip tied it uh, next to um, heating pipes and it melted and took a plant down so mm -hmm. you can't you can't just erase. Where, where's 5G when you need it, Brian? Uh, yeah. Uh, you can't just erase one piece of technical debt and think that, you know, like on the ERP side only, and think you've, you're going to be golden because other debt issues on other things are going to come back and bite you. Related to that, not only on that kind of gear, but on like um, the industrial machine tools, all of them have like firmware and need may need upgrades as well. So they may be behind on technical debt. And uh, I've got uh, there's one company I, um, I deal with all the time that they had um, their plants have been starved for capital for so many decades that they've got like leaking roofs and you know. It doesn't do you any good to put in a new ERP if snow and water can fall down on like a CNC machine on the floor and short it out. I mean, you know, so that's not going to get it. Um, anyway, that, those are just some of the ideas. Um, real time is hey, hard on Periscope. Hey, hey, okay. Greg, just, <laughs> hey, Greg, just one real quick thing on that front. If you're having trouble with the per Periscope stream, I just want to make sure you and other people are aware that this stream's in basically five locations. So it's like all the all the John Reed you can handle. Um, the main stream is on LinkedIn. That's where the most of the commenting is. And there's a link in my Twitter stream to that. Um, you can also find it on YouTube at Jonathan W. Reed. Um, it also broadcasts on Diginomica Facebook and John ERP Facebook. So it's pretty much an overdose. So, uh, so anyhow, if you're having trouble on one stream, just, just try another. And you can comment on any of the streams and it'll come through for us. So it doesn't matter. Uh, this is a StreamYard backend, by the way. It's, it works pretty well. Um, Den says, I train in that discipline and never understood standard cost. It doesn't make sense unless you believe Taylorism is real. Mm, he's talking about Frederick Taylor, time and motion studies. And um, I don't know, Den, if you ever read a book, I don't know if I can find it on the bookshelf, but um, there was a guy named uh, uh, Mint, Mintz, Minton or Mintz. Uh, and he wrote a book where he evaluated every major like management theory and management school of thought uh, over the last hundred or so years. And he took on Frederick Taylor and others, too. And uh, kind of he, he'll disabuse you of any number of those kind of things. Standard costing, though. Yeah, well, actually, I, I don't have a problem with a standard and an actual cost as long as you've done your very best to make them as relevant as possible but when you've got everything all lumped up and averaged up together that's where it gets really fuzzy to me and frankly i'm more interested in uh let's say margin contributions uh without before we get to allocating the bejesus out of the other stuff and for those on the call that are still with us there's a company out of the i think out of the west coast called a profit velocity and if you've got your act together in your company, you've got good data and you know what it costs to make a product and all that, the next level where you need to go, you need to check that company out. I don't have any dealings with them, uh, it, but they'll make you rethink, and Dan's comment made me ponder this, um, they'll make you rethink everything you thought you knew about like cost accounting and variances and pricing and how you should price your product based on your availability of critical machine tools and everything else. It's a great um, solution to check out. And I know those guys at Prop Velocity were probably cringing because they're going, Brian always thinks of us in cost accounting terms, but, uh, but you know, their name would belie it or tell you a different story, but it's cool. So going back to the 
sort of beginning of all of this, I think Brian did a terrific job of basically deconstructing a lot of the mythology around uh, why ERP systems underperform. Um, I wanted to get into a little bit what motivated this this topic and why I proposed this for with Brian. Um, I'm I'm kind of challenging cloud ERP vendors right now to get with me on this topic. Uh, I started with Acumatica and they actually sent me their custom maturity model. Um, and in in my piece that I did on Diginomica on this, the CEO John Roscoe acknowledged that there's a percentage of their customers, albeit a lower percentage, but he acknowledges there's a percentage that really don't uh, aggressively pursue the benefits of of the platform. And one of the reasons I think customers get into trouble in this is that they a lot of them are um, when you look at is they're they're especially with these mid market cloud ERP they're stuck on such archaic solutions before that you know they're running 20 versions of QuickBooks or they're trying to do stuff on spreadsheets that they're kind of ecstatic about the you know having one mobile friendly UI or what have you um, but my whole point that I've been trying to make again and again is that that's just the beginning of what you should be trying to get out of these systems and one thing I wrote. A couple of years ago on a piece I want to update at some point, I wrote about how cloud ERP isn't a handshake deal. It's a challenge to extract value. And, and what I basically said um, is despite the benefits you might achieve, most cloud ERP gains don't seem to come until well after go live. And even more concerning, you know, a number of customers never get to the advanced stages of cloud ERP. Um, because it requires organizational will and a fierce collaboration with the vendor and or consulting partners that we just don't see. Um, so anyway, in that piece, I delineated a whole bunch of what I perceive as the more um, advanced benefits that you can potentially achieve. Um, and I won't get into all of them now, but what I would say is to vendors out there, if you have stories of, of customers that are achieving the more advanced benefits, do let me know because, frankly, when I ask for this, I don't usually get very many examples. Um, and so, you know, that's my throwdown challenge today is, uh, you know, show us some examples of customers who are really pushing into the advanced stages here and are really tackling some of the thorny problems that Brian put out there because Brian's not trying to discourage people into, you know, fatigue and, dis and, and failure. He wants to challenge people to do something that sticks. So at least that's what I think you're doing. Yeah, in fact, I would argue the concept you guys need to get your head around is this thing called convergence, which has been um, – it's what high-tech companies do all the time. They think about the technologies that are going to be powerful and viable like three and five years down the road. So they don't build an application based on today's technologies and capabilities. They want to build something on the – technologies to come so that when it's finished, bam, they've got something that's very relevant in the market. And I think a lot of a lot of companies need to take that concept of convergence to heart. And they need to think about if we don't want to just buy something because it can do a function now, we need to be thinking, what is it we want to be doing as a company in three to five years from now? And how do we line up all these different moving parts of technology so that they converge into this one killer uh, capability for the company uh, at that right time? Yeah, the messages you're talking about are issues SAP thought they were addressing 93 to 97. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, they didn't get addressed and we still don't see it. I mean, the, the one the one thing I will say is I do think that the so-called customer success movement has put pressure on vendors to start tackling this more aggressively because there was a time where you could really get away with shelfware, Brian, where you could essentially sell license and if someone used your software or not, it didn't matter, you just kept billing them. Maybe you would even audit them for their trouble. <laughs> But but now you, you can't you can't do that because um, if if your users aren't embracing and aggressively adopting your software, the chances are that you're vulnerable to some other better solution coming in there, or they'll initiate it on their own and start using whatever the fuck software they want to use, and uh, so you, your vulnerability gets exposed. And so I think it is forcing uh, software vendors to think about that because they want to retain these customers, and if they don't show demonstrate that they can help them on this road then they're out of it. And Brian, one thing that's kind of interesting along those lines is I ran into several anecdotes this week of customers like 
planning transformational projects, including supply chain products in particular, also uh, a customer project, customer like commerce project. And the ERP vendor didn't have a seat at that table, even though they were the ERP vendor been running for many years. They weren't granted a seat in the transformation discussion. And I think this is the reason why is because they haven't shown that they're relevant to that. And so they have to show it or they're not going to be. I guess as a buy side advocate, I totally understand why a lot of folks don't invite a vendor in on some of those discussions. Um, yep. And, uh, and I think any vendor that ever finds himself being excluded from those conversations needs to take the mirror and look inwardly and find out why. And, um, you know, I, I, I will tell you, there is a bit of a hubris out there where there are vendors who think that because of their market share or the amount of lock-in that a customer has, that they don't need to worry about this um, uh, you know about customers wanting to lead them or whatever and, and there is some truth to that I mean it's painful to do a you know yank old solutions out but I will tell you I find it fascinating every year more and more companies seem to be migrate moving towards more and more vendors who are uh, the white hat wearing cowboys in the market who take the friction out of stuff and are trying their best to solve problems now the one thing I do want to add real context around your point is um, I think vendors confuse delighting customers with implementing something fast and while I think there is value in having a product that's straightforward to implement and tools to make that happen speed of the implementation is not where the value necessarily resides. It's in the impact you're going to have on the greater part of the organization. And any vendor who's or reseller or systems integrator who's still peddling a TCO story, a total cost ownership story, needs to cut that stuff out now and figure out how you can actually add real value that's going to show up in a material way on the bottom line of the company's financial statements. If you can't come up with a compelling return on investment, you don't know what you're doing. And that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, Dent Den points out that we're hashing out a lot of stuff that feels like an echo of the past. I, I think that is true. Um, but Brian, to your point, there are a lot of upstart vendors. You've written about a number of them that are trying to do yeah. things differently. Yep. And uh, I think, um, and you know, this is something Dem was writing about a lot in terms of transparency of pricing and the desire for new transparent pricing models and software. And I think there's a growing movement to that as well. But um, you know, it's we're not there yet. Let's let's face it. I mean, we're just not there yet. Well, on that point, uh, to your point and Dens, I think that's why there's growing interest in software vendors uh, to possibly acquire and integrate products like. Um, there's the Salonis out there, which I know Denon has written a lot about. Uh, they operate in this white space beyond ERP and can help with all kinds of process uh, change. And uh, there's uh, there was a competitor to theirs that uh, SAP recently bought. Uh, uh, Signavio. Uh, yeah, and there were, yep, and uh, uh, and I'm thinking of another company out there. I think it was. Uh, uh, Integramat, I uh, can't, anyway, um, there are, those folks actually have the ability to throw off a whole lot of value. And if you actually use those in conjunction with an implementation of a new ERP, you can change the value story. Uh, but, uh, you know, helping your general ledger close, you know, uh, six milliseconds faster than it does today is not going to get you in the door. It's not there. And, and if you're a systems integrator and you're technology people, all they know how to do is to map data from an old system to a new one. That isn't enough. That's not adding value. You need, you need the kind of people uh, to do, um, to do something Different, that's different in creating value other than automated transaction a little bit faster. Den Catchulator, thanks for dropping in from yep. from your from the plush couch of retirement and look forward to your future vocalizations. 
thanks for joining, Dan. I appreciate and, it. Good, good and, to hear and, from you. And dinner picks as well. Mm. I'm sure. I'm sure you've got a tasty uh, dinner lined up uh, at the moment, or perhaps you already just ate. But anyhow, catch you later. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I totally agree with that, Brian. And I, and I think, um, you know, one one of the things that we talk with a lot of vendors about right now is how, you know, it, it's that thing around like how how can you demonstrate wins as you progress in these projects and the appetite for these multi-year projects just isn't what it was. And I think that's one of the good, the good parts about this is customers are losing patience with elaborate multi-year technical upgrades um, that, that don't have any perceived benefit beyond some arguable TCO that is really meant to wash over past mistakes and proliferating instances that they didn't need in the first place. That's not a business case and, and that's not transformation, you know? Yeah, I know uh, one of my clients paid a half a million dollars to an ERP vendor to come up with a strategic plan for him. And all it was was a giant, um, it was some words around their price sheet. And uh, I looked at the client and I go, I'll, I'll do that project for 20% of that and I'll it, it will rock your world compared to the plan that you got from them. I mean, a plan that's only about their own products is not a plan. Anyway, so, and you can't add value and you can't work off of a, a plan like that. So, anyway. Yeah, I would really like to see, you know, this is the thing I have been stumping on a lot is I would really like to see uh, customers be more creative about the people that they bring in to have a look at their 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 project plans in the early going. I think dependence on um, the systems integrators of the past is a big part of the, the problems that you're describing, and you know th those folks need to be put on notice that that they're accountable. And the the best way to do that, in my mind, is to empower a smaller boutique or independent to essentially perform more of a watchdog role and one that understands their industry and their problems and to, you know, you got to come up for air on these projects more often. And we talk about real, real time and right time. When you study these project failures that come out from time to time, they, these companies go months and months, it seems, without coming up for air and figuring out, like, can we have a oxygen check on, is anyone still alive? Can we have a morale check? Mm. And, uh, you know, that's one of the big things to me is where are your project checkpoints? Where, where are your... Uh, checkups where you take a look at your progress or lack thereof and figure out what's going on. So anyway, that's a, that's an unsolicited pitch for your services, Brian. So just bring Brian onto your project. Things, things will go better as long as you can put up with a, a few uh, strongly vocalized opinions. You know? Actually, what a lot of people don't know is I, I use uh, some colleagues, other industry analysts, whatever, on projects. And I actually have to put language in my arrangement letters that tells people like, you know, these folks, we all have strong opinions on stuff based on a lot of experience and just dealing with the, whatever the vendors and other clients. So uh, I don't do that to apologize. I actually go, and that's okay because our clients generally benefit from hearing the two different goalposts, if you will, seeing what those are on a given issue, and then they can figure out where they want to go from there. Uh, it's the it's to help people become very aware of what the realities are out there and their options, whatever going forward, as I think where a lot of real value gets imparted. So um, I don't think anyone should ever apologize for having um, new perspectives and to challenge people. That should be part of every kind of project uh, just to get people to think. Yeah. And one other point, uh, you know, for vendors, if you're, if you have a, if you have your own version of a customer, customer maturity model, like Acumatic Ascent that I wrote about, uh, please do forward along to, to Brian and myself. We'd love to have a look, look at how you're uh, getting your customers to these advanced benefit stages, potentially beyond the, the sort of, the go live stuff we discussed of so-called single source of truth or, or what have you. Um, and one of the points that, that Brian made that I thought was really critically important before we went live today is talking about that there is, there's one danger that I'm stepping into with, with my sort of advanced benefits thing, which the message being like, after go live, keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And I'm not going to back down from that because I believe in that, but Brian makes a really important point, which is that, 
you can sometimes make fateful decisions prior to go live that impact your ability to extract benefits after go live. And Brian, you were describing again the the dangers of a of a of a limited or insular approach to accounting. And if you configure your software in a way that is too insular and not forward thinking, then unfortunately you can't really go back and fix that. So while there is an argument for pushing into deeper benefits, you're making an important point that you have to get a lot of this right in the initial go live. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a great analogy I'd like to use, but um, I've rebuilt a whole bunch of cars in my life and dozens of them, absolutely dozens of them. And you got to know, before you get started, you have to know where you're what you really want to do here because if you decide um, you're going to put some monster huge engine in or whatever you need to know that now so that you put the right transmission behind it in the right rear end on the vehicle uh, so you don't have something that overpowers what the rest of what's there or the other way around and i think a lot of people when they go to configure these applications the gut reaction or the first reaction on a lot of project teams is to set things up very similar to what they did before but if you do that, you probably will set up like your account. And let's just take the chart of accounts. If you don't think about all the new cool analytics that you're going to bring in and the news production stats that are going to be available, then you probably didn't set up enough statistical accounts to, in the financial system to hold that data. You probably also didn't weren't thinking about where you might want to make changes on, like we talked before, in inventory and cost accounting and all these other functions. And there may be things even in the uh, in the CRM system that you would love to be able to know about that you're going to move all over the enterprise so that you can capture data around customer, customer probability, lifetime customer value, and everything else. You have to be thinking about how are we going to collect that stuff and at what level of detail we're going to move it all the way through. More than anything else, you want to make sure that the level of detail now and the level of detail in the future are the same. That's what you really should be shooting for. Anyway. Right. And so that ties back to your, your point on, on speed, right? In the sense that, that if you rush that process to try to get to a quick go live, you may have really shortchanged yourself in a way that you can't easily undo later. Correct. So, correct. Yeah. Absolutely correct. Um, um, you'll end, if you do, you're going to have to do a complete reinstall. You may have to change every interface, every integration, um, all kinds of table configurations, and, 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 and. Um, you know, there was an old joke about there's one of the major systems out there that they would describe it as being infinitely flexible before you do the install, which would be true. But then afterwards, the installation itself is like pouring concrete in a jello mold. And once that bad boy sets up, there's no changing it going forward. Uh, it's yep. really rare to ever find a company that uh, once they implemented their ERP, that they actually went and made any material changes to the code block, the chart of accounts, or anything else. Uh, why? Because it's just so disruptive and so highly interconnected to all the other systems in the company. So if you're going to do it, do it right the first time uh, because rework generally is never an option. Yep. And and look, I mean, there there are some white, what I would consider white hat ERP players right now that are that are really pushing ahead on solving some of these issues. But um, I wanted to have this conversation because uh, it's our job to keep these folks up at night. And uh, <laughs> and, and and I apologize. <laughs> I apologize to some of them because they're probably looking forward to a nice, relaxing weekend, and now they have to tear up their slide decks. But, uh, hey, it's a good thing to do over the weekend. Uh, Brian looks like someone's going to order your book this weekend, so there you go. Wow. Um, I better be careful and not spend all whatever $3 in royalties I'm going to get off of that sale, but I want to thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. And um, uh, should, should it not be uh, the responsibility of the software vendor to provide best practice configs automatically when the instance is deployed. Should it not be? Well, uh, I'm, a, I'm on two minds on this point. Uh, one is I would love it if they were uh, come with 
I'm going to kill her new kind of best practice ways to do something. That would be fantastic. You know, maybe they threw in some RPA and uh, created some uh, super analytical, uh, uh, whatever, supercharged AI driven analytics to go with it, whatever, you know, that, that, yes, I would love to see vendors provide that. On the flip side, it is the customer's responsibility to think about how they're going to drive competitive advantage in their firm. And the further away you get from uh, a tactical application like payroll or fixed asset accounting, and you get to something that gets closer to a customer or to a uh, job seeker or an em uh, employee, whatever, a supplier, the more you get closer to the external constituents, then the more strategic that function is. And I think it's the employer, or excuse me, the uh, enterprise's job to figure out what that is and how they're going to make that really ruthlessly, competitively advantageous. Um, and and uh, and and uh, Greg says, I think I'll watch you guys here on LinkedIn. But leave comments on Twitter if you don't mind. Greg, whatever you want to do, man. Um, that's the whole point of the multi-streaming is that uh, it, it meets your needs. I'll see your comments in the stream either way. So whatever you'd like, uh, you can do. Um, glad you're able to join us in real time. I know a lot of times you listen to the audio later, but it's great to have you on the real time chat. And it happens just about every week at at four four p.m. Eastern time, approximately. Sometimes it time varies a little and uh and brian is going to be a frequent returning guest as you can see he always delivers uh and then finally uh i'm evolving my visualization applications and training material around it as we talk awesome brian right into the one powerpoint seeds another and the love goes on it's beautiful <laughs> uh love you guys thank you hey I mean that that was kind of what I always wanted with with a with the video show was to inspire uh, in that way and like have more of a, a a communal experience I guess than rather than just you know just another talking head thing where you sit and listen. A lot of the video shows I see are just like just there's only one or two comments because people are just droning on and it's all about listening to the gurus and I it drives me nuts, man, because. Uh, uh, you know, it takes a bunch of us to get this right. It, you know, there's a lot of smart people watching that are that need to be included in this dialogue if we're going to figure out the problem. So, thanks for coming. I appreciate that, and um, and folks, I uh, I know it's old school, and I have tens of thousands of uh, like PowerPoint materials I've built over the years, and I've, I create them, if you will, generically because I use a lot of them in articles, things to go out to like Digitomic and beyond. Um, but I learned a long time ago that the old uh, picture's worth a thousand words is uh, right on the money. And um, Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I had a boss one time tell me, and I'll, I'll just pass this along, that the real stroke of genius is to be able to simplify a graphic so that any idiot at the airline lounge at the airport could draw it on the back of a cocktail napkin in 30 seconds or less and look like a bloody genius. And... And he's so right about that. Uh, I'm not going to say who, but John and I have a colleague who creates some amazing um, graphics. Oh, yeah. I know and, who you're talking about. And and every one of them is just choked full of new kinds of buzzwords and buzzword combinations. And you're going to need 20 minutes just to read the slide. You'll need another 20 to figure out kind of what some of that means. And I'm really all about let's try and find a way to simplify it and, and keep it, you know, on message. Now, today, John was correct. I, knowing what we're going to talk about today in like 30, 40 minutes, I put those slides together just to break up the, you know, the conversation to give us something else to look at. But um, Brian, on to, Brian on demand, what well, doesn't get any better than that, man. Um, Greg, you just got here for the talking heads. Well, dude, I don't know what I don't know what to tell you, man. Uh, but but you're you're live now, man. You're you're interrupting the talking heads as we speak, which is the whole point. Um, I always tell people like this is the one show where I tell all my guests like be prepared to be interrupted all the time by our commenters, which is what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I saw someone earlier today that had a big um, subscribe button on their video stream during the video, like the whole time. You're never going to see that crap on my show. Promise you that. Um, there's never going to be a sponsor. This is a total uncommercial operation that's designed to 
you know, whether it flies or not, it's designed to get to the bottom of these issues, and I can't afford to have that compromised in any way. So, um, but Greg, glad you made it, even if it was just for the end. And we have uh, Mr. Weepernit, uh, who's a very frequent uh, commoner. Um, you have a lot of software that needs to be connected without having many a APIs, while modernizing is deemed too expensive, not necessarily the software is bad. Yeah, we are kind of getting into some heady discussion right at the end here, Brian. I'm not sure we can resolve all of that in the moment. Right. Um, you know, yeah, this, I, I, and I know we've gone on a long time, and, uh, and yeah. look, I'm not throwing any of the new um, integration technologies and uh, all the new API protocols. I'm not throwing any of that under the bus. All that's great. Uh, but the, if there was one thing I really wanted to get people to get their head around is, folks, you got to have a plan what you're trying to do here. And uh, that probably takes precedence over anything else. How you connect all the dots, I think, is very doable today and much easier than it used to be. But, um, uh, you know, there's cleanup work you got to do. There is upgrades of other things that have to happen. There's rethinking the kind of level of detail and data you want and where you want to go. What's the destination? Um, I don't know if I put it in that book or not, but I, I, I say it all the time, public speaking bits, that a lot of people look at these projects as kind of like uh, like uh, if your your mom and dad said, quick, kids, let's all run out and get in the station where we're going on vacation. Make sure you bring some clothes. And the first question you're going to ask is, where are we going? And, and uh, because that determines, like, what are you going to bring along for the trip and everything else? And uh, I don't know. We'll know when we get there. That's not an answer. That's not how you should be approaching, you know, these technology projects like this. You need to know what the destination is. And then you need to figure out how are we all collectively going to get there, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, have a good time when it's done. Yep. And I think that's going to be the last word. Um, Greg, uh, the Clubhouse versus Discord platform thing. Um, I know you saw my comments on uh, – on Derek's blog on Clubhouse on Diginomica. I don't have anything further to add to that, so I would just direct you there. I think you saw those already. Uh, Brian, you and I have used up an hour and a half of time. I think we are good. Uh, Thomas, thanks for joining for the wrap. Uh, next time we'll catch you a bit <laughs> sooner, but you can uh, enjoy the replay if perhaps. Uh, it was a juicy discussion full of acerbic slides and commentary. Um, so, um, and Greg wants to know how will you ever bring optical effusion of value without a subscriptive base of presentation? In your genre, your video, your <laughs> I mean, Greg, I mean, you, you, you pulled the, you, we, you, you asked the question miss, that was, how did we miss that on our, uh, our unpredictions? That sentence alone, that question should have been our unpredictions column back, uh, this, in November. This, one, this one's for you, Greg. <laughs> well, well done. Thanks, Greg. Well done. All right, Brian, we'll catch you next time, man, and catch you guys next week. See ya. Take care, everyone.